So Reed, you want to maybe tell a little bit more about sort of why we're different? You know, sure. give a little bit more detail. Sure. What's your name there? Akshay. Akshay. So Akshay, what would so you you want you want to be in the pharmaceutical business? You want to make a lot of money, help a lot of people. Um, what's the most business profitable kind of drug you could pitch to a venture capitalist? So you, you want the venture capitalists to go, I want in, man, I want all of this. How, what, what is, what is, what's going to turn those guys on the most? What are they looking for? Story. Well, okay, so, so they, well, they want to make a lot of money, obviously. They want to put an investment in. So what they want is they want a chronic disease that lasts for your whole lifetime for which there is expensive, effective therapy. They want you taking that pill every day. They want you spending thousands of dollars a month. They want you completely dependent on it. They want it patented. That's what they want. So what are some diseases? So HIV is such a disease in North America. So you can live a normal life with HIV uh, by taking these antiviral medications. They're very expensive. And, and so vaccines, like the worst business model, right? Because you give one shot to somebody and they don't get sick. So where's the excitement there? Like, you know, move on with your idea. So it's not easy to get vaccines funded whether you give them away or not because they don't sound good in the classical business model of pharmaceuticals. And that's starting to change because if you're a government, especially with a single payer health system, you're gonna hang on to that person for their whole life. So you don't want them to get HPV and get cervical cancer. You don't want them to get HIV or hepatitis a C, for which there currently is no vaccine. And so the government of Australia paid for every single adolescent boy and girl to have HPV vaccine because they know if there's cancer later, Australia, which has a single payer, single payer health system, will have to pay for that. So we are already different because we're in the vaccine space. We're already, and then we're, we're doubly different because we are trying to use a computer model in conjunction with um, sort of this basic immunochemistry platform and we're also using a vaccine platform that doesn't involve recombinant human protein and does not involve any dead or live virus. It's a very simple, uh, it's a very simple uh, mechanism that uses only the targets identified by the computer model to, to attack cells that are infected with HIV. And the, the third thing, of course, is we're trying to do this uh, for free, meaning without, um, without getting any royalty stream back to us. So those are very different kind of things. And the first thing we did and we started this project to understand the landscape of potential support out there was to do a crowdfunding campaign and and it like like uh, people in the um, uh, like people in the uh, uh, medical business like me we don't know a lot about communicating on the internet and Navina Y Combinator uh, we, we and I went to Y Combinator and they helped us um, do this it was a fascinating for us to see all the support there was for an idea like this out there so um, so I think one of the biggest challenges we've faced with Immunity Project is uh, it's, it sounds too good to be true, right? So actually, this is advice that uh, PG gave us. He said, you know, the number one problem you guys are going to have is that it just sounds too good to be true. You know, how is it that you guys have figured out, uh, you know, a, a, a potential solution for something that uh, tens, uh, many other pharmaceutical companies, many other uh, researchers all over the world, uh, you know, have been working on for literally for decades, have spent tens of billions of dollars trying to solve. Why are you two dudes, you know, and your team, the folks to figure this out? And so my answer to that question is that I think that the biggest innovations that are going to happen in our world going forward are going to be blends of disparate skill sets, are going to involve blends of disparate skill sets. So in this case, you have a novel blend of computer science and biology. And I think that is, is one reason. So if you look at the traditional drug development market, most people who are biologists or you know, researchers sitting in a lab, um, they're, they're not very comfortable necessarily even with computers. You know, they're very comfortable with with uh, lab equipment and doing things in a lab, in sort of a lab environment, they don't necessarily understand, wow, you could use a computer to, uh, to iterate, to very rapidly uh, sort of test and try to figure out, uh, using an algorithm of some kind, you know, what possible weak points on any given virus might be. Um, so, so I think that's one reason why I think we're unique versus many other groups that are out there. 
Second reason is we're attempting to mimic something that already works. So one out of 300 people who are living with HIV have a natural immunity to the virus. Now, most people don't know that. So one out of 300 people living with HIV have a natural immunity to the virus. So these are people that, you know, they, if they come into contact with the HIV virus, it, it, it doesn't necessarily progress to AIDS. They might still have a viral load. You know, there are different sort of shades of gray here in terms of how, quote unquote, immune you are to the HIV virus. But uh, these people exist, and we call them HIV controllers. So the question is, and by the way, we're not the only group attempting to ask this question. What makes these so-called controllers different from everybody else, from anyone in this room versus a controller? And by the way, some of you might be controllers. You just don't know it. So what we've sort of figured out, and again, as Reed mentioned, in partnership with Microsoft Research, is it's, we think that they have better targeting capabilities in their immune system. So their immune systems are able to uh, identify these, these biological markers on the surface of the HIV virus that happen to be the virus's Achilles heel. And when you attack the virus at these locations, it forces the virus to mutate into a dormant state that it can't easily mutate away from, and it renders it essentially inert. And that's how we think HIV controllers work. Now, there are other hypotheses out there, but that's our hypothesis. And so what we were able to do is, working with Microsoft Research, we were able to essentially design software to attempt to reverse engineer these so-called HIV controllers and figure out what, tar what are these targets? That was the question we were trying to answer. What are the specific targets on the HIV virus that these so-called HIV controllers are preferentially targeting and therefore rendering the virus inoperable or inert? And so that's essentially the work that we carried forward uh, with our drug delivery system. And I'll talk about the crowdfunding thing in a bit, but why don't you give a little bit more detail about the drug delivery system that you and our team invented? Sure. So basically, uh, as Devine said, there's this interesting uh, factoid that one in 300 people are, are controllers. And better than that, there was a guy at Harvard, is a guy at Harvard, who actually collected blood samples from several hundred of these people and put them in a, in a freezer. So the researchers at Microsoft were able to go back to that database of blood and, and, and using a technique, I won't go into a lot of detail, but it's possible to do a chemical experiment to figure out from the blood itself what part of the virus uh, the immune system of an individual is preferentially targeting. And uh, they did a very elaborate experiment to decode that targeting sequence in each individual uh, test tube. And by using a machine learning algorithm, they were able to go through and get a very specific target list of known targets in HIV favored by the controllers. So they published that list in an article in a, in a journal called Virology last year. Uh, at about the same time, we published our article on our, uh, on our platform that we designed uh, working with one of the Microsoft researchers. And our platform is a, is a, uses a biodegradable microsphere, the same size as an antigen presenting cell, and some molecules called adjuvants that, that fire up the immune system and get it all excited about being attacked. So the idea is a Trojan horse. We put a, we put a particle inside a, inside a subject and they go, wow, I'm, I'm getting a horrible infection. They think that because these signals that we're sending with the adjuvants say, wow, infection present. So the, the immune system attacks our vaccine and then dissects it and what it's going to find are these preferred targets in HIV and it will educate killer T cells in the body to go after those targets if that HIV virus were ever to show up. So it is a where the plan is to get a durable response here where uh, you know, years later, if you get an HIV infection, your killer T cells will attack and kill any cell that's infected with that virus. So that's the sort of elegant design objective. And it really is driven by this, this natural, natural historical analysis of these marvelous people who have a intrinsically very, very, uh, really randomly, but intrinsically happen to attack the virus at these preferred points. It's the firmware of their immune system that does that, and we think we can copy that firmware in anybody by the use of this vaccine. It's almost a reprogramming of your immune system to go after these same targets. So most people don't think about this, but everyone in this room is under attack 24 hours a day, right? So you actually have more um, bacterial, viral, other sorts of things, DNA in your body than your actual human DNA. And 
um, your immune system is what keeps you safe, right? So your immune system is essentially what's protecting you from you know, any of these possible infections from, from carrying forward. Um, as a re but as everyone, I'm sure, in this room believes, you know, I know there are people out there who don't believe this, but uh, these things evolve. <laughs> they change. They're not static. Um, so bacteria are always mutating. Um, and, and they're always trying to figure out you know, how to gain an edge. right? And your immune system is evolving right alongside. So your immune system is learning, if you will, um, on an ongoing basis. And you've got marvelous machinery um, in all of your bodies that, that execute on this process literally 24-7, you know, every single day of your life. So as Reed mentioned, what we're essentially doing is we're, we're harnessing this natural ability that you all have um, to learn um, about anything that your body comes into contact with, short of something like HIV that is A, attacking your immune system, right? So you're, you're, you have a finite number of bullets, if you will, in your immune system gun, uh, and B, is mutating very rapidly. So that's the problem with HIV. That's why HIV is so challenging um, of, a, of a virus to solve. So our thought process is, OK, if we know what the targets are on the HIV virus that are preferred by HIV controllers, is there a way to essentially teach anyone's, anyone else's immune system about those targets so we can essentially turn them into a controller as well. And so that's, that's what our team is, has developed, is, is using, as Reed called them, these biodegradable microspheres. So think really small bubbles, about 11 microns in diameter. right? And we have a patented process where we can essentially take these targets and you know, put them in, in and around these spheres right? and combine these spheres with chemicals, call them adjuvants, these are chemicals that cause an immune response. So the idea is that it really is a Trojan horse in, in, the, in the very direct, tangible way of thinking about a Trojan horse, except it's happening within your body in real time. Uh, and it's, it's, we're, our, our goal is to teach your immune system. Yes? What's the size of like, an HIV? So you said like, your Achilles heel you know, immunity is 11 microns. You mean the virus itself? M yeah. much, much, much smaller. So uh, we, we show the video of the uh, phagocytosis. Do you have it on there? Um, let me see if I can figure that yeah, I mean, well, yeah, it, well, of course, the Trojan horse is very big, and the, and the, and the Romans got inside the horse, right? So we're, we have, we have a, the, the sphere itself is like the horse, and the, the targets are like the soldiers inside. So the, 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 the dendritic cell says, wow. Um, I, I'm seeing this thing that I should be concerned about. I'll take it inside my cell, and you can see this is, this is a time-lapse photograph. This shows these are the antigen-presenting cells called dendrocytes here. These big black things are, are our spheres containing the, the vaccine. They're taken up by the cell. The cell then disassembles that sphere and says, oh, I see these targets in there. I'm biologically programmed by nature to make those targets of interest and I'm going to program killer T cells to kill anything that shows those targets at a later date. And what targets we put in there are precisely those targets that HIV controllers prefer. They're very tiny 11 amino acid long targets called class 1 epitopes. Yes, sir? Are you a pain killer? Pardon me, sir? Are you a pain killer? Are no. No, no. So the, so the next step, actually I met with the FDA yesterday. Uh, with the C director of the Center for Biologics, and the next step is for us to meet with the FDA, explain all this to them, and then file what's called an investigational new drug application, which is permission to test in humans in the U.S. And we actually are going to file that in the U.S. We probably may actually test it in, in sub-Saharan Africa, where the, where the incidence of HIV is much higher, but we will do that with a U.S. application. Yeah. So, so in terms of, does that give you guys a pretty good understanding of how this vaccine works and why we're different? Okay.